from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. In 2001, poet Stephen Dunn won the Pulitzer Prize for Different Hours, a, poet, a volume that shows how from one hour to the next, everything from our human perspective can change and then morph back again as he jumps back from the personal to the larger human landscape. His work is eminently quotable. Spending time with this poetry is rich and powerful experience because you are in the hands not only of a master of the craft, but also a very generous and humane spirit. His poems are on one hand cozy and on the other hand unsettling with the rawness of truth related in an unflappable manner. They invite you in and you do not get bored. You want to stay and hear it all. You are nourished and better for the reading. So the great news is he has a wealth of these treasures. He has 16 collections of poetry. And there is a, there is a signing at 4.30 in the sign, book signing tent. His latest is the t has the timely title of Here and Now. You hear the words grace and elegance a lot when people discuss Mr. Dunn's poetry. The lines are short, pulling you through the thread of the poem in a mesmerizing way. They are often short. The other thing he has is an emotional intelligence and psychological insight is the strength of his work. You wouldn't look at this person, perhaps, and think there's someone who can write authoritatively and masterfully from the mind of Charlotte Bronte, relocated in modern New Jersey. But you are utterly convinced and enriched by this poem, satisfied by the dig this digression in the long conversation of literature. It's because of this rare combination of warmth and wit, I guess, that you see all these prizes in his career. And you see him published in the New Yorker often and the New Republic and the Atlantic Monthly. His book, Local Time, won the National Poetry Series in 1986. In the years surrounding that, he also won, I believe, three fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. So where does all this come from? I'm gonna do a brief, very brief biographical sketch. He can tell you more about himself. He, he was born in New York City. He studied English and history from Hofstra University, attended the New School writing workshops, and earned an MA in creative writing at Syracuse. He also worked as a professional basketball player, and less surprisingly, a copy, copywriter and an editor. He lives in Frostburg, Maryland, and is a professor of creative writing at Richard, Richard Scott Stockton College. He has taught in many other places, including Columbia University, University of Washington, Syracuse, Princeton, and the University of Michigan. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Stephen Dunn. Greetings. Thank you very much, that was lovely. Uh, you, you often get praise when you get introduced and, and occasionally you feel understood. I felt a little understood in that one too, which, which feels better even. I usually try to start a, a reading with uh, a poem that's appropriate to place. Uh, I don't think I have one, though I have, maybe to the spirit of place I do. Uh, I have a new poem called The Statue of Responsibility. And, what, excuse me, one of the, uh, thank you. One of the interesting things I think about being an American is we have, we take our liberties for granted. Um, it seems crucial uh, to take our responsibilities for grant, not for granted and as, comp as a companion to liberty. So I've invented a statue of responsibility. Imagine it's given to us as a gift from a country wishing to overcome its own hypocrisy. I can see someone standing up at a meeting and saying, give it to the Americans, they like big things for their people. They like to live in the glamour between exultation and anxiety. Instead of an arm raised with a torch, let's insist they cement its feet deep into the earth, burden it 
with gigantic shoes, an emblem of the inescapable. We place it on land across from Liberty on the Brooklyn side. And I can see myself needing to visit it regularly, taking the elevator up to the chest area where I feel I need some, where I'd feel something was asked of me. Near its heart, I'd paint, after the tyrants, there's nothing as hateful as the martyrs. And I'd stare at those words, trying to understand my motive to enlighten by desecration. In one of its enormous feet, I imagine a gift shop where tourists can buy replicas of responsibility for themselves and friends they think might need it. And I'd want bumper stickers selling for almost nothing. Less talk of conscience, more of consciousness. I can see my friend, the ex-altar boys, for so long injured by memory, writing near the statue's eyes, see everything, overlook a great deal, correct a little, then scratching jagged lines through that wisdom of Pope John Paul II, clearly now irresponsible. And yet his words remain ones I'd like to live by, how to defend that, how to decide. What do you think is the most misused and overused word of our generation? Like, like is, of course, an easy, easy one. I think uh, most, most would agree, but I'm thinking of another one. Awesome. 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 Uh, it seems to me, you know, if so few people have ever experienced anything like awe, and if, if they have, it makes them quiet, I think. They don't go around saying that was an awesome ice cream cone. Or, uh, so this is maybe an attempt to resuscitate that word a little, certainly to criticize it, uh, but I must find it first. One second. hiding here. The poem is called Love. Found dead in an alley of words, awesome, no hope for it. And share, which must have fallen trying to get by on its own. And near the trash cans, almost totally exhausted, the barely breathing cool. But there's love among the disposables, waiting as ever to be lifted into consequence. And here comes a forager looking for anything that might get him through another night. Love's right in front of him, his if he wants it. In the air, the ashy smell of cliches, the stink of obsolescence. He's leaning love's way. All the words are watching, even the dead ones. It's as if what he does next could be the equivalent of restoring awe to awesome, that love, if chosen, might be given back to love made new again. But the man is just a man out for easy pickings. Or has he just remembered how early on love always feels original? Let us forgive him if he keeps on foraging. Well, I'll just stay with love for a moment. Uh, this is a poem that tries to get away with two uh, advocacies of love, one for language, the other for my wife. Uh, it has some lines I've stolen from Pablo Neruda in there. I won't tell you which ones they are. Um, and for those of you too fond of semiotics, that you might feel you might wince a little uh, here and there. Language, a love poem. When I say your hair is the color of a moonless night in which I've almost 
Let me start again. When I say your hair is the color of a moonless night in which I've often been lost, I mean approximately that dark. And the dove outside our window is no symbol, merely wakes us at dawn. It's made a grayish creature that coos quite poorly. Peace is an entirely different bird. The rose to me signifies the rose, and the guitar signifies a musical instrument called the guitar. At other times, language is a slaughterhouse, a hammering down, its subjects hanging from hooks on the verge of being delicious. When I say these things to you, it's to watch how certain words play, play, play themselves out on your face, as if no one with imagination can ever escape being a witness. The whale, for example, no matter its whiteness, is just a mammal posing as a big fish except, of course, if someone is driven to pursue it. That changes everything. Which is not to suggest I don't love the depth of your concealments. When I say your name over and over, it's because I cannot possess you. If a clown if a clown came out of the woods, a standard-looking clown with oversized polka dot clothes, floppy shoes, a red bulbous nose, and you saw him on the edge of your property, there'd be nothing funny about that, would there? <laughs> a bear might be preferable, especially, especially if black and berry driven. And if this clown began waving his hands with those big white gloves that clowns wear, and you realized he wanted your attention, had something apparently urgent to tell you, would you pivot and run from him or stay put as my friend did, who seemed to understand he was a clown who didn't know where he was, a clown without a context. What could be sadder, my friend thought, than a clown in need of a context? If then the clown said to you that he was on his way to a kid's birthday party, his car had broken down, he needed a ride, would you give him one? Or would the connection between the comic and the appalling, as it pertained to clowns, be suddenly so clear that you'd be paralyzed by it? <laughs> and if you were the clown, and my friend hesitated as he did, would you make a sad face and with an enormous finger wipe away an imaginary tear? <laughs> How far would you trust your art? I can tell you it worked. Most of the guests had gone when my friend and the clown drove up and the family was angry. But the clown twisted a balloon into the shape of a bird and gave it to the kid who smiled, letting it rise to the ceiling. If you were the kid, the birthday boy, what from then on would be your relationship with disappointment, with joy? Whom would you blame or extol? Don't do that. It was bring your own if you wanted anything hard, so I brought Johnny Walker Red along with, along with some resentment I'd held in for a few weeks, <laughs> which was not helped by the sight of little nameless things pierced with toothpicks on the tables, or by talk that promised to be nothing if not small. <laughs> but I consented to come, and I knew in what part of the house their animals would be sequestered, whose company I loved. What else can I say except that old retainer of slights and wrongs, that bad boy I hadn't quite outgrown, I brought him along too. I was out to cultivate a mood. My host greeted me but did not ask about my soul, which was when I was invited by Johnny Walker Red to find the right kind of glass and pour. I toasted the air, I said hello to the wall, then walked past a group of women dressed to be seen undressing them one by one, and went up the stairs to where the Rottweilers were, Rosie and Tom, and got down with them on all fours. They licked the face I offered them, and I proceeded to slick back my hair with their saliva, and before long, I felt like a wild thing, ready to mess up the party, scarf the hors d'oeuvres. But the dog said, no, don't do that. <laughs> Calm down, after a while they open the door and let you out, they pet your head, and everything you might have held them against them is gone. 
and you're good friends again. Stay, they said. History. It's like this, the king marries a commoner and the populace cheers. She doesn't even know how to curtsy, but he loves her manners in bed. Why doesn't he do what his father did, the king's mother wonders, those peasant girls brought in through that secret entrance. That's how a kingdom works best. But marriage? The king's mother won't come out of her room and a strange democracy radiates throughout the land, which causes widespread dreaming, a general hopefulness. This is, of course, how people get hurt, how history gets its ziggy shape. The king locks his wife in the tower because she's begun to ride her horse far into the woods. How unqueenly to come back to the castle like that, so sweaty and flushed. The only answer his mother decides is stricter rules, no whispering in the corridors, no gaiety in the fields. The king announces his wife is very tired and has decided to lie down, and issues an edict that all things yours are once again his. This is the kind of law history loves that contains its own demise. The villagers conspire for years, waiting for the right time, which never arrives. There's only that one person, not exactly brave, but too unhappy to be reasonable, who crosses the moat, scales the walls. Talk to God. I will talk to God as soon as I find him. Talk to God. Thank him for your little house on the periphery, its splendid view of the wildflowers in summer, and the nervous fork prints of deer in that same field after a snowstorm. Thank him even for the monotony that drives us to make and destroy and dissect what otherwise would be merely the lush unnamed world. Ease into your misgivings. Ask him if, if in his weakness he was ever responsible for a pettiness, some weather, say, brought in to show who's boss when no one seemed sufficiently moved by a sunset or the shape of an egg. Ask him if when he gave us desire he had underestimated its power. And when, if ever, did he realize love is not inspired by obedience? Be respectful when you confess to him you began to redefine heaven as you discovered certain pleasures. And sympathize with how sad it is that awe has been replaced by small enthusiasms. That you're aware things just aren't the same these days. That you wish for him a few evenings surrounded by the old stunned silence. Maybe it would be possible then to ask why this sorry state of affairs? Why after so much hatefulness done in his name, no list of corrections nailed to some rectory door. Remember to thank him for the silkworm, apples in season, photosynthesis, the northern lights, and be sincere. But let it be known you're willing to suffer only in proportion to your errors, not one unfair moment more. Insist on this as if it could be granted, not one moment more. A couple of summers ago, I was at the McDowell Colony, uh, and there was a poet named Spencer Reese there, a good poet, who, uh, when I was leaving, I was going home. When he was leaving, he was leaving to be ordained as an Anglican priest. Uh, and we became friends, and one night he, he asked if I would listen to a long poem of his about where he grew up, which was Hartford and about Wallace Stevens and his mother. Uh, and it was a, a good poem, but I knew something that Stevens had said that he didn't know, 
which I thought the poem needed, which was, the poet should never yield to the priest. Uh, and I mentioned that to him, it screwed up his whole poem for a while, happily, I think, and I, th I think he agreed even afterwards, happily. Um, and that even caused me to write, I, I suspect, one of the more ecumenical poems I've ever written, uh, If the Poet. If the poet doesn't yield to the priest, as Stephen says he shouldn't, and if both reside in the same village and call on their powers to rectify or explain the latest disaster, does the priest become less persuasive because his ideas are likely not his own? And is the poet suspect for the same reason? Would a good priest find the right words as the good poet would in among, in among the many words passed down for centuries on what to think, what to believe? Or would reverence always get in the way of the true, thus possibly giving the poet the edge? That is, if the poet mistrusts words as he should, makes them pass hard tests, knows they must be arranged and shaped in order to convey even a smidgen of truth, wouldn't he, although self-ordained, be more reliable? But what if the villagers believed they were saved by a prayer the priest said on one, sun one Sunday among the ruins, and all the poet could do was elegize the ruins? Would the real and the imagined fuse become something entirely new? And what if the poet and the priest were one, each invoking the other as the crops grew and rain was steady in rainy season? Or just as confusing, things got worse and prayers proved useless, and poems merely decorated the debris where a house once was. Would it be time for the priest to admit he'd known but one book, for the, po for the poet to say he'd read many and look, it hasn't helped? Or has the issue from the start been a great need that can't be fully met, only made bearable and sometimes served by those who try? I wonder if any of you have a time of day when you're most likely to get in trouble. Uh, mine is around four o'clock in the afternoon. It's getting pretty close. Uh, I think I'm all right uh, right now. Uh, this is a poem called Bad. which I must look up, sorry. Right there. Bad. My wife is working in her room writing and I've come in three times with idle chatter, some not new news. news. The fourth time she identifies me as what I am, a man lost in late afternoon in the terrible in-between, good work long over, a good drink not yet what the clock has okayed. Her mood a little bemused, leave me the hell alone mixed with a weary smile and I see my face up on the post office wall among men least wanted, <laughs> looking forlorn. In the small print under my name, annoying to loved ones in the afternoons, <laughs> lacks inner resources. I go away, guilty as charged, and write this poem, which I insist she read at drinking time. She's reading it now. It seems she's pleased, but when she speaks, it's about charm and how predictable I am, how when in trouble I try to become irresistible, like one of those blonde dogs with a red bandana around his neck. <laughs> Sorry he's peed on the rug. <laughs> Forget it, she says, this stuff is old, it won't work anymore. And I hear, good boy, good boy. <laughs> and can't stop licking her hand.
the imagined. If the imagined woman makes the real woman seem bare-boned, hardly existent, lacking in gracefulness and intellect and pulchritude, and if you come to realize the imagined woman can only satisfy your imagination, whereas the real woman, with all her limitations, can often make you feel good, how, in spite of knowing this, does the imagined woman keep getting into your bedroom and joining you at dinner? Why is it you always bring her along on vacations when the real woman is shopping? or figuring the best way to the museum. And if the real woman has an imagined man, as she must, someone probably with her at this very moment, in fact, doing and saying everything she's ever wanted, would you want to know that he slips into her life every day from a secret doorway she's made for him, that he's present even when you're eating your omelet at breakfast? Or do you prefer how she goes about the house as she does, as if there were just the two of you? Isn't her silence finally loving and yours not entirely self-serving? Hasn't the time come once again not to talk about it? What a, what a nice audience you are. I'll read you a poem about my ex-wife. I wasn't going to read this one, but what the hell. Uh, uh, it's about kind of a, a, a benign argument we had for many years that continued and continued. It had to do with crows and her contention that crows always travel in threes. And no amount of empirical evidence would dissuade her of this fact. Seriousness. Driving the Garden State Parkway to New York, I pointed out two crows to a woman who believed crows only travel in threes. And later, just one crow eating the carcass of a, of a squirrel. The others are nearby, she said, <laughs> hidden in trees. <laughs> she was sure. Now and then she'd say, see, in a clear, dark trinity of crows would be standing on the grass. I told her she was wrong to under or overestimate crows and wondered out loud if three crows together made any evolutionary sense. I was almost getting serious now. Near Forked River, we saw five. There's three, she said, and two others with a friend in a tree. <laughs> I looked to see if she was smiling. She wasn't. <laughs> or she was. Men like you, she said, needed written down, notarized, and signed. <laughs> what goes on? After the affair and the moving out, after the destructive, revivifying passion, we watched her life quiet into a new one, her lover more and more on its periphery. She spent many nights alone, happy for the narcosis of the television. When she got cancer, she kept it to herself until she couldn't keep it from anyone. The chemo debilitated and saved her, and one day her husband asked her to come back, his wife, who after all had only fallen in love as anyone might who hadn't been in love in a while. And he held her so different now, so thin, her hair just partially grown back. He held her like a new woman, and what she felt felt almost as good as love had, and each of them called it love because precision didn't matter anymore. And we who'd been part of it, often rejoicing with one and consoling the, with the other, we who had seen her truly alive and then merely alive, what could we do but revise our phone book, our hearts, offer a little toast to what goes on? I've had a long argument with a friend of mine, good poet, uh, who writes a lot of poems about 
space aliens and things like that. And our, our argument always centers around my contention that you can't write serious poems about space aliens. And he always proves me wrong. And, and in fact, he uses my arguments against me often. But I thought I'd try one myself. <laughs> the melancholy of the extraterrestrials. <laughs> Most of us who've insinuated ourselves into their work days and country clubs come home at night and immediately take out our little radios and report to the mothership that our accents have been perfect, our manners seamless and undetectable. I, for one, have lived for such praise. We'd look at each other, honored to be serving our planet, then break out a bottle of something and toast the seats on school boards and to those future sinecures of leverage in local government. To what end? That was only hinted at. Blend in, the elders told us. Be effective. When history becomes the subject at any gathering, Remember to have sympathy for the Indians, mild disapproval for the colonists, and do try to be neutral when the talk turns to outer space. <laughs> it was good advice, but the cost of our achievements began to show on our faces. After a while, I'd bring home a weariness, and when I'd look in the mirror, I'd see a creature made of smoke and pretense, losing desire to please the mothership, which had begun, all of us felt this, to take us for granted. Why were we doing what we were doing? Last week, one of the humans invited me to meet his wife and children. I began to fear that soon I might be asked to break into that stash of electroatomic weaponry, weaponry we were given and do something otherworldly to these people who, in spite of their relative lack of culture and intelligence, have shown me such kindness. They are guilty, I see now, only of being born on the wrong plat planet at a time of our ascendancy. I just got the 10 minute sign, so I will be, I'll read one more and then I'll take some questions if you're in, inclined. Now let's see what I shall read to you. around the time of the moon. The experts were at work doing expert work. Amateurs were loving what they hardly knew. Houston Tranquility Base here, the eagle has landed, came over our televisions. Accidental poetry, instant lore. Our parents couldn't believe it. Can you believe it, said my sister Sam. Elsewhere on terra firma, a chemist must have smiled an inner smile, having perfected Agent Orange. Mistakes were made, said our president. Nary a personal pronoun could be heard. My friend on acid said he was the bullet, but sometimes also the wound. The moon was finished, he went on to explain. Never again would haunt or beguile. Mary Travers was leaving on a jet plane, didn't know when she'd be back again. I, for one, was sad. Soon everyone had a harmonica, on every street corner a guitar. A few of us thought we thought it was possible to change the world. We were love's amateurs, it's happy fools. I let my hair grow into a badge, became an expert on right and wrong. And, on, and, and, excuse me, and under artificial light in my room, read strangely comforting books about alienation and despair. Meanwhile, almost unnoticed, quotation marks descended from the sky, began to fit around everything we thought we knew. And trod upon or not, the obstinate mood would only be itself, kept bumping up the crime rate, lifting the helpless seas. Thanks for listening. Happy to take questions if there are. Yes. I think you have to go to the phone, the microphone. 
Okay. <laughs> if I understood that right, Chuck, <laughs> uh, I think you asked, have I reconciled? The Billy Crockers. The Billy Oh, I thought you said something else. The Billy Crockers was from our neighborhood. He, he was an evil guy. I was terrified of Billy Crocker. I have not reconciled. I, 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 I used to go around saying nothing human is alien to me. You know, Terence's great comment. Crocker remains alien to me. Uh, <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Hi, thank you for being here. I had a question about your writing process, uh, specifically your editing process. How do you know when to stop? It's one of those questions that uh, has many answers, really. Sometimes uh, you show it to your wife or, or a good reader or a friend, and they make ugly faces at it. Uh, there's, a, the, the great sense of, there's a great sense of delusion when you finish a poem, uh, when it's hot and you've done some good things, and you think it's finished. It's rarely, in my experience, rarely so. I think Auden says, you don't finish poems, you abandon them. Uh, but there is that click. There's a click that occurs. But that's, that can make, that, because if you handle rhythm well, that click can be very delusional also. Because you, you've completed the music of the poem, but why should anybody, anybody care? It's always a sticky question. I've, I've had. I'm a reviser, a rather endless reviser, and my editor always had to save me for myself and said, no more. That's probably the real answer. Uh, no more. No mas. Hi, uh, listening to your poem today, I was thinking of a few poems by Richard Wilbur, such as Shame, uh, one of his poems. And then also I was thinking, um, it seems that Billy Collins uh, has echoes of your some of your approach also. The three of you have you know started your careers some years apart, but I just wondered if there was any influence among the three of you interplay at all. Just wondered uh, any comments you might have. On that. Uh, I don't I don't know. Uh, I've always admired Wilbur, uh, especially daring essentially to write the same poem while so many fads and different movements were in the air. Uh, always a poet of great integrity, I think. Uh, but I think that's a limitation too uh, of his. And and uh, Billy's poems. Uh, Billy tries to be understood. I admire that. Uh, uh, most people, he writes the simplest thing. Don't understand. The audience doesn't understand. I, I have students in my class who. Somebody writes a line, I went to the store and bought a loaf of bread. They say, what the hell does that mean? You know? uh, and most people think poetry is written in code. Uh, and one of the things I admire about Billy is that he, he dares to, to, to let you understand what he's saying. Could you talk about uh, uh, the part books have played in your life, beginning with early childhood, uh, your reading habits, and then how that's informed your, your poetry? Uh, yes. Uh, I grew up in a house without books. And somehow I, I found books. I think uh, a few intelligent girlfriends helped. Uh, but uh, the first book that Truly, well, I read, I read a lot of you know sports books and things like that. First book that truly mattered to me was the Brothers Karamazov. It was not a book of poetry. I didn't read poetry seriously until I was in my t mid twenties. But Karamazov uh, knocked me out. Did the thing that that good books do to you, where you find yourself nodding, uh, where, where you're giving assent to what, that which you partially understand. I think good poems, good, good, good literature articulate 
not what we never thought of, but what we half knew and didn't have words for. And uh, the Russian, no I, was, I was a history major, a, a Russian history major. The Russian novelists were very important to me. Uh, uh, the Theodore Rethke, finally important to me as a poet. Uh, Wallace Stevens, Frost. These are the people I returned to. But I had, I, when I went to graduate school at age 30, I was so far behind everybody else, all the 22 year olds. I, 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 I read voraciously, for, to, I read catch up, I played catch up. And I didn't know, so I don't know really what my influences are. I read so much at, in a short period of time. Uh, but the people I return to are the ones I mentioned. Just now. Hi. How long does it take you to write a poem after you have an idea? And secondly, I have a difficult time understanding some New York, New Yorker kinds of uh, poetry, and I'm wondering if I'm a, a party of one on that or among a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> I would hope you're, you're a party of one. I can't be sure. Uh, those poems that have been in there seem uh, to make gestures to the reader. I always think, I think it, has to, it has to be a gestalt. The, the, the poet makes gestures to the reader, the reader meets him halfway, makes those gestures. And sometimes they're just poems that are not for you. You know, not for, they're, they're, they're not, they're, you shouldn't like them. Even if even somebody says, this is, a, this is a great poem, there's no re what reason why you should like that. Uh, what was the first part of your question again? As as how long does it really take to write a good oh. poem? <laughs> uh, it is so varied. I, 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 I tend to generate a lot of poems when I go, say, to a writer's colony for a month. And they seem more or less finished when I leave, and, I, and they're never finished. I work on them for the year. Uh, I keep changing them. The longest this ever taken was 11 years to finish a poem. Uh, but I've written a poem that has finished itself in a draft also. The answer is somewhere in the middle, about a year, year and a half. Anything else? Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.